she wouldn't want us, you know, wasting time crying and, you know, sitting around feeling bad. I still think that, that she's there somewhere. You said that you want to kill her earlier. When did I say that? Being the capital of the Canadian province of Nova Scotia, Halifax is home to over 430,000 people and is recognized as being the 15th most friendly city in the world. Within Nova Scotia, other parts of Canada, Greenland and Alaska are the indigenous people known as the Inuit, which some may know as Eskimos. In 1977, the term Eskimos was officially replaced by Inuit and has slowly been fading from language. We will be using Inuit instead of Eskimos and also Inuk, which is the singular pronoun of Inuit. Loretta Saunders is a 26-year-old Inuk woman who is going to school for criminology and specializing in missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Although she struggled with sexual abuse, drugs, and homelessness in her younger years, Loretta has been working hard to get herself on the right track, even planning to become a lawyer and advocate. Loretta was also mostly staying at her boyfriend's residence ever since she became pregnant and had subleased her apartment to a couple to help get some extra money coming in. February 13, 2014 Loretta told her boyfriend that she needed to go to her apartment to collect rent from her roommates, but did not say when she would be back. The boyfriend, Yelchin, was an international student studying at the same school as Loretta and was the father of the unborn child. Yelchin did not see Loretta the next day, Valentine's Day, but he was receiving text messages from her that she was with a friend and would see him later. Yelchin did not think much of it until time passed, and he received more text messages. These were different. Loretta was talking about having money issues and getting locked out of her bank account from not remembering her password. With Loretta's history of depression, Yelchin became anxious and decided to call her family. He told them everything, and after talking, realized that they were all receiving the same text messages. This was starting to get unusual, as Loretta was extremely close with her family and would usually talk on the phone with them every day. After hearing that Yelchin has not seen her for about four days, Loretta's mother decides to call the police. Since her family live thousands of miles away, they start their drive to Halifax immediately. In the meantime, police visit the boyfriend, since he is the last known person to see Loretta. Yelchin showed them all of the text messages he received from Loretta since the last time he saw her, also stating that she was pregnant and has a history of depression. Police asked if he knew who the friend was that she was with, but he had no idea. Yelchin also had never met the couple that was subletting a room in Loretta's apartment, so there was not much to go on at the moment. With that, the police go to Loretta's apartment, and the superintendent lets them into her unit. Nothing is out of the ordinary. Food is in the fridge. Valuables have no trace of trying to be taken, no signs of a struggle. Nothing. But most importantly, no Loretta. It has been four days since anyone has seen her, so police decide to get the missing persons unit involved. They also immediately secure any CCTV footage the apartment complex has. Looking at the footage, they skip to the time that Yelchin said Loretta left to go to the apartment. At 10.53 a.m., 43 minutes after pressing play, they spot Loretta. The superintendent is able to confirm it is her. 
Unfortunately, there are no cameras in the hallways, so they keep watching the main entrance and back door cameras, which are the only two ways of leaving the apartment to see when she leaves the building. Detectives look at the footage over and over again, analyzing every single frame. But Loretta is never seen leaving the apartment. Police looked everywhere in Loretta's unit, but she was not there. They also realized that her roommates were not around either. After going door to door throughout the apartment building trying to find witnesses, one neighbor states that he saw Loretta's roommates leaving for a trip sometime before Valentine's Day. When a detective calls them, the roommates confirm that they left for a Valentine's weekend trip and were 200 miles away with family and have not seen or heard from Loretta since before they left. Detectives are back at square one with no leads and their main suspect being the boyfriend since he was the last one to see Loretta. Family members had also voiced concern about Yelchin, believing he may have had something to do with it. It was known that Loretta and Yelchin were arguing recently, and that Loretta was unsure of the relationship, so detectives speak with Yelchin to get his side of the story. He states that they argued like any other couple, but that he loved Loretta and was very excited for the baby. After looking around Yelchin's residence and speaking to him, detectives cannot find anything to link him to her disappearance. It's been almost a week since anyone has seen Loretta. Family and friends gather search parties and go on news channels, hoping to help in any way. Around this time, detectives also get Loretta's bank statements. And finally, get their first lead. They see that there is a credit card transaction at a coffee shop drive through hours after she entered her apartment. Detectives head to the coffee shop location right away, which is only about 10 minutes from the apartment. Thankfully, there are cameras facing the drive through and they still have the footage from that day. Detectives immediately look through the footage, and at the exact time the credit card transaction was made, they see what may be a glimpse of hope. It's no doubt Loretta's car. Detectives can now feel that Loretta is alive and may still be with her friend, since they notice that there are two people in the car. They find another angle that is able to show more of the inside of the car. It's not Loretta in the driver's seat, though, but a white male with very short blonde hair or bald. Even though this should make detectives feel better that she may be alive, they feel uneasy as they try to track where the car goes after leaving the coffee shop, but none of the cameras are able to pick up which way they turn. Police search the area for Loretta's distinct car, while the detectives go to nearby stores to see if any have CCTV. Thankfully, they find a Walmart nearby, with multiple cameras. Watching the footage, one of the detectives notices Loretta's car passing through the frame, leaving the parking lot. They rewind the footage to see when it first arrived, and find that they were parked on the curb. Watching the individual that came out of the passenger side, they get a bad feeling. Looking at a camera from inside the store, that bad feeling gets worse. The person that was in the passenger seat, who they know was the same person in the passenger seat at the coffee shop because of the clothing, is not Loretta. Now they have two unknown people driving Loretta's car just hours after she arrived at her apartment. Police put a bolo out for Loretta's car, all throughout Canada. Thankfully, not long after, a police officer sees a car much like Loretta's. Looking up the license plate, it is in fact her car, 2,000 miles away, 
in Ontario. Police arrest the two individuals in the car and take them to get interrogated. While Ontario police question the pair, IDs of the two are sent over to the Halifax police. Looking at the names on the IDs, detectives realize they now have faces to go along with the couple. That was subleasing Loretta's apartment. Blake Leggett and Victoria Henneberry told police that they were 200 miles away with family. So why are they now seen 2,000 miles away? And with Loretta's car? Blake states that they did not want to pay the money to buy plane tickets for their trip, but thankfully Loretta was selling her car. So they bought it off her. This is the first time hearing about Loretta selling her car. So detectives talk to Victoria. While Ontario detectives interrogate the two, Halifax detectives go back to the CCTV footage in the apartment. Since now they know what Blake and Victoria look like, they searched through the footage the same day Loretta went into the apartment to collect rent from them. Around four hours after Loretta walked into the apartment, Blake can be seen coming out of the elevator with a large bag. Looking farther, Blake continues to bring more bags, corresponding with their story about taking a trip. Lastly, Victoria exits the apartment, and they do not enter again. Since detectives didn't see Loretta leave, and they couldn't find her anywhere in the apartment building, there is only one conclusion for them. Loretta was hidden in the large bag that Blake was carrying. The best piece of evidence they could find, though, was a video found on Blake's phone. This is why Victoria should not drink. Really, I really think I don't want to be with you. Any, when and I'm if you, and if you, stupid. Why? What have I done? You can't even say that you really want to kill Loretta. You said that you want to kill her earlier. When did I say that? You're lying. With all of this information, they want Ontario detectives to keep interrogating the couple, hoping to get one to talk. Finally. After telling Victoria that she needs to be Loretta's voice and tell the truth, Victoria tells the detective that Blake killed Loretta. They then have her direct them to where Loretta's body is, and she leads them to a wooded area right of a highway in New Brunswick, about 200 miles away. Police search the area and find the large bag Blake was carrying, and inside was Loretta. Blake is found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison with no eligibility of parole for 25 years. Victoria pled guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to life imprisonment with no eligibility for parole for 10 years. Back down to the courthouse, I, deep down in my heart I was, I was praying and I was saying, God, if you're real, I'm sorry to be questioning you. If you're real, God, and you really have my daughter with you, please ask them to plead guilty. And it was so funny. Then I would say, oh, my God, what's that? You know, I was talking to God, and, you know, God answered my prayer. And the, all the prayers, the people, supporters who've been praying for us all through, our prayers was answered, and i like to thank everybody. I'm so mixed feeling, I'm hurting, I'm, I'm going to miss my girl, I'm glad that we don't have to go through what we had to do, and I'm feeling bad for their parents, it's like it's, I don't know, I'm overwhelmed, I'm really overwhelmed. Loretta Saunders' murder was just one of the many murders of Inuit women, and even though it was not considered a hate crime, 
Her murder helped the missing and murdered indigenous women movement. Loretta's sister, D.M. Saunders, went on to be an advocate for indigenous women. Unfortunately, she struggled with opiates, partly due to Loretta's death, and passed away in 2021.